Good morning, Finland. Good afternoon, and China. Welcome to Tencent Dialogue, a place to learn from the great minds of our time. My name is Sam Tsang, senior expert of Tencent Research Institute. I will serve as your humble moderator for this event. Today, our topic is the road to carbon neutrality and sustainable development. As we know, with serious uh, global warming and climate change, the international community has taken active actions for carbon neutrality and sustainable development. China has set the goal to be carbon neutral in 2060 as a pioneer of urban sustainable development in Europe. Helsinki has unique experience in this regard, and the practices are valuable for other cities in the world. This dialogue will have in-depth discussions on the opportunities, challenges, and the pathways for cities and technology companies to achieve carbon neutrality. We will also discuss the challenges to get global cities to adopt more innovations to deal with uh, climate change, uh, discuss sustainable development issues in a broad sense. Uh, today, we are honored to have two distinguished guests to join us. Uh, Honorable Mr. Yuan Vapavohi, Mayor of Helsinki. Welcome, Mayor, Mayor Yuan. Uh, and we also have uh, Mr. David Wallenstein, Chief Exploration Officer of Tencent. Nice to have both of you here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. Good morning <laughs> and best wishes from Helsinki. Uh, please allow, allow me to uh, briefly introduce our two honorable guests first. Uh, Mr. Yuan Vapav Ohi is the mayor of Helsinki. After an extensive career in Finnish national politics, he became the first uh, politically elected mayor of Helsinki in June 2017. He set forth a city strategy that champions Helsinki as the most uh, functional city in the world, with a special focus on sustainable growth, digitalization, global problem solving, and the best possible conditions for happy everyday life. This is very important. And uh, Mr. Uh, Vapavo, he also served as the Minister of Economic Affairs, Minister of Housing, uh, Vice President of uh, European Invest Investment Bank. Uh, welcome, uh, Mayor Yuan. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. David Wallenstein, we call him uh, DW, is currently the Chief Exploration Officer of Tencent, also Senior Executive Vice President of Tencent Group. David drives Tencent's participation in new technologies, business areas, research collaborations, and ideas. He has worked on building Tencent international footprint and entrance into new business areas since 2001. And today, actually, we also have a group of leading experts with us, uh, including uh, Professor Yan He from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, he's also the winner of uh, Explorer Prize in the field of energy and environment protection. We also have uh, Professor Hua Yi, the director of Konaya China Cen Center uh, from of uh, Konaya University. We also have experts from China uh, Europe International Business School. Uh, from uh, also have experts from uh, environment organization like Paradise International Foundation the Nature uh, Conservancy, and also like the Swedish Environment Research Institute, and also my colleagues from Tencent. Welcome, all of you. Uh, today, I think the dialogue will be roughly organized as follows. I will give some questions to both our speakers and guide the uh, discussions. I think after the dialogue is the Q&A session, and our online experts will raise some questions and uh, give comments. The point is that we will give our guests enough time to have in-depth and a detailed discussion on carbon neutrality and the sustainable uh, issues. And I think it's a fireside chat style. So we feel relaxed and we are looking forward to your inspiring ideas. I think it will take around like a one, hour, one hour and uh, 30 minutes for, for this uh, dialogue. Okay, with this, uh, I think let's move to our uh, dialogue. I think first, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, uh, Mayor Yuan uh, a question. Uh, could you please introduce 
us uh, some background about Helsinki because uh, I think most uh, of our Chinese audience are not really familiar with the with the city. Thank you. Thank you. Helsinki is the capital for Finland. Uh, Finland is a relatively small Nordic country with a population of roughly five million people, which is something like a medium-sized Chinese city, maybe. And the, the Helsinki is the capital for the for this country, with uh, six hundred thousand in, inhabitants. Uh, we uh, are a, a part and member of the, the Nordic society in, in many ways and then very close to, to also uh, countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and, and cities like Stockholm, Copenhagen, Oslo. Um, the city has been ranked as the happiest city in the world. Uh, I noticed some when you said that a uh, happy life is something which is really important. I think it's it's the most important thing and, and the most important mission a city can have is to create best possible conditions for 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 happy life, but we also otherwise, I mean, uh, ranked very well in a huge amount of different kind of international comparisons, uh, all the way from uh, least corrupted countries and, and cities to to those uh, most innovative uh, cities in, in the world. Uh, as far as carbon neutrality is concerned. We do have a, a quite ambitious uh, commitment to become carbon neutral by 2035. And uh, our track record uh, already so far has been quite impressive. Uh, so uh, today's figure is that we have already been able to reduce uh, emissions by roughly 30 uh, percent. And, and the number is actually even more significant if you take into account that the city has grown all the time. So, so per capita, we have been uh, able to reduce emissions already by more than 40%. Um, we are uh, on our path and uh, I'm sure that we will reach the goal to be carbon neutral by 2035. Actually, I think that we will do it some years in advance. And, and let me finish by, by telling you that uh, it was actually yesterday when we decided to close one of our two uh, coal-driven power plants in the city of Helsinki two years earlier than the plan was. So the plan was to, to, to close it uh, in the end of 2024, and now we decided to do it latest on the 1st of April 23, which means that uh, this decision alone uh, will decrease the emissions of the whole country by 2%, of the city of Helsinki by 20%, uh, and of the, the energy company with more than 40%. Maybe this as a small glimpse of, of my dear home city. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Yen. I think uh, uh, I, I, I have a, a set of questions regarding the carbon neutrality you just mentioned. This is a very hot topic here in China now, as you may know that China set the goal of uh, to be carbon neutral in 2060. So a lot of cities are also making plans for carbon neutrality. Before we go into a uh, detailed discussion, I'd like to start with a philosophical question. Just now you mentioned that you have closed uh, uh, some coal plants uh, earlier than expected. So. How do you see the relationship between economic growth and the carbon neutrality? How to how to balance how to balance this? Because I think this is something uh, those Chinese mayors also want to know. I think that you can um, have a look either on a, a short term or a long term, and if we take the short term angle first. I think that especially Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, has shown already something like 15, 20 years ago that uh, you are able to, to decouple these two issues. And it is, it, it is possible 
to drive economic growth and at the same time reduce emissions. Uh, and uh, this is something which has been possible already, already today and already for a, 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 a some period of time. But but in, in the long run, I, I believe that these two would be even more in balance. So you could say that it, it could even be that a prerequisite for economic growth will be that you at the same time drive a, a sustainable policy and that you are able to reduce emissions. Uh, uh, I mean, saving the planet will most possibly be the biggest business in the world. And uh, those who are forerunners within this business will most probably also be those who have the best possibility to drive economic growth at the same time. Okay, thank you. Saves the plan, it is the biggest business in the world. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, can you share with us uh, some of the practice for uh, carbon neutrality in like Helsinki? I think it's important to start from the basics, from the big picture. I think the starting point is that you need to know what you want. You, you, you need to want to reduce emissions. Uh, you can't achieve something if you have not decided to achieve it, if you are really not committed to do it. And, and when I talk about you, I mean a, a, a large group, uh, the, the, uh, not only the, the mayor him or herself, but what the city as a whole and also the city as a, a community so um, it is a, a challenging task and it's just impossible to take any real steps forward if you are not really committed to do it and that's why it, it should not and it can't be just a declaration that you want to be carbon neutral by that or that year you really need to want it you really need to deeply understand why you are doing it and and and, and, and having the will the, my second point is that there are no silver bullets here either uh, i mean i very often face a question where people ask me what kind of projects or programs you have in order to be carbon neutral and i i used to reply that it's not about programs or projects it, it's about a, a holistic view. It's about the comprehensive uh, approach, uh, and, and that is the, the, the only the key to, to success in, in, in this field. Let me put it also this way, um, especially in, in I mean European um, discussion, uh, there are, um, some people uh, underline the importance for 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 regulation. There are especially some politicians who do think that the only way for a sustainable future is, 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 is uh, tighter regulation. Then there are some other people, especially in the US, who believe that technology will be the, the uh, solution and uh, the, the only way really to make progress is, is, is uh, development and, and, and a big development uh, in the field of technology and innovation. And then there are some uh, places, I mean, I think especially in, in, in Western Europe and maybe Nordic countries, which believe in, in, in behavioral change of, of people and who believe in awareness raising. And I do believe that we need all of those three. You, you can't choose between awareness raising uh, technology or regulation, and actually you, you need them all. And you all need to understand that they are linked to each other. So. Um, if just to, to take an example, uh, uh, building codes is one important um, tool in, in order to, to uh, make more energy efficient buildings. And there, European countries especially have chosen the way to go through regulation and by, by uh, tighter and tighter uh, uh, building codes. But tied to building codes also leads to a, 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 a better technology. 
there is a inspiration and it like encourages uh, the, the the private sector to, to innovate in, in order to make uh, that happen in a, a cost efficient and sustainable way. So my point is that uh, um, there are no silver bullets. Uh, you need a holistic view. Everything matters. Everything counts. Uh, uh, you need to understand where your emissions actually come from, and you need to have a, a holistic view, comprehensive uh, approach. Uh, you need to be commit committed, and you need to be consistent. Okay, thank you. I, I agree with you that we do need a comprehensive approach for uh, carbon neutrality, including tech innovation awareness and also like regulation. So maybe next question I'd like to ask David. You have been uh, driven the tech development of Tencent for, for many years. So in terms of uh, technology innovation for carbon neutrality, what do you want to share with us? I feel like I have, um, you know, Mayor Jan is uh, right in the middle of it right now. I mean, I'd love to ask him some more questions about what he's going through. I think, you know, I'm on the side more of looking at next generation technologies for um, carbon neutrality. A lot of them haven't really been deployed yet. And uh, I mean, I was very impressed to hear about the 30 or 40 or 40 percent that the mayor has achieved already. Um, and uh, I, I think it would be very interesting, actually, to hear a little bit more about that. You know, like, how are you actually getting the 30 or 40 percent? Um, because I think, as you were saying very clearly, Barryan, my understanding is you weren't achieving that with new technologies, um, uh, not not to the extent that I'm aware of anyways in Helsinki. So um, maybe uh, I could flip it around a little bit and ask the mayor, you know, how are you actually getting That's a very substantial uh, a margin there of progress. And my assumption is that there's so much waste in the system already existing that, as you said, the moment you start targeting uh, reducing the waste, you'll immediately find it. It seems like you've found kind of an easier low hanging fruit, if we could say 30 to 40 percent. So I'd love to hear what what were those things? And do you think it'll get more difficult now over time to do more and more, you know, find more and more efficiency or do you think actually now that you've got it started, maybe it gets easier? You know, so is it that you found low hanging fruit and that was easy? Now the hard work begins, or is it more that now that you've made that progress, you have an inertia? It's kind of rolling, and you think you can get more and more efficiency from from there. Mm, let me start by telling that when we drafted our carbon neutral Helsinki plan for 2035 we started, of course, by measuring where our emissions come from. You, you need to know what you need to solve. And uh, uh, I mean, roughly, you could say that our biggest problem is uh, our biggest source for emissions is, is heating the city. Uh, more than 50% of all emissions in Helsinki um, originate from, from, from that. Uh, the second biggest is, is, um, is traffic and, and so on and so on. And then we put up a, a action plan with 147 action points in, in order to tackle each and every source uh, we have for, for emissions. And you could roughly say that, I mean, if heating the city is 50% of the problem, then also it needs to be 50% of all the, of the solution. And if it is 20% of the, the, the challenge, then then uh, it uh, the, the, it should also stand for 20% of the solutions and so on. Then uh, next point is that those are different stories, for example, heating and traffic, totally different stories. As when you talk about heating the city, the problem is that you use fossil fuels and especially coal, also natural gas, but especially coal in Helsinki. And the way to reduce emissions there is then to get rid of coal. Uh, and in, in order to get rid of coal, uh, you, you at the same time, you should think about two things. The first one is that you should try to uh, um, have, make efforts in order to decrease the need for, for energy. So you need to have more energy efficient buildings and then so on in, in order to reduce the, the amount of energy you need. And then 
you need to replace coal uh, by, by renewables. And that is what we have done. So you could say that the city of Helsinki is growing all the time. It's not growing as rapidly as uh, Chinese cities do, but more than one person a year. And even if we grow year after year, we have been able uh, not to need more energy for heating uh, during the last 20 years, despite of the fact that that we are growing. So you could say that the, the improvement we have done in the field of energy efficiency has helped us uh, then to solve the problem. And then uh, the next question is that, and there you need technological uh, uh, solutions, uh, is, is how to, to uh, replace coal. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, in today's world, it is, it's mostly heat pumps and restoring heat and, 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 and things like that. Uh, in, in the future, maybe some some even more advanced ones. So it's, it's about energy efficiency and it's about replacing coal by new technological solutions. Then when you talk about traffic, it's a little bit different story. I mean, even there, it's, it's a problem, it's an issue of technology. As you know, I think the, the car manufacturers are maybe the, the most dynamic uh, um, sector of, of, of industry in today's world and the technology this is improving all the time. And, and we are making steps forward to the, I mean, uh, electric cars all the way. But at the same time, it's also a question of, of like urban planning. It's, it's a, a question of, of planning a city and avoid urban sprawl. And, and what I mean in practical terms is that what we have, I think, managed to do in, in some Nordic cities uh, is that we have been able to create cities where people walk more without deciding to walk more. Uh, if you understand what I, what I say, that if you are able to, to plan and uh, develop and build cities uh, which are like uh, human sized, as, as I mean, in today's world, we talk a lot about 15 minutes cities. I mean, in Helsinki, you could even talk about five minute city. That most of the things you need in your everyday life is within a, a walking distance. That, in many cases, means that you walk without deciding to walk. And that then means that you need less traffic and you, you pollute less and, and, and cause less, uh, less, less uh, emissions. Uh, so um, what I'm may, maybe trying to say is that each and every source of emission has their own unique story. And you need to understand it, uh, and, and then you have uh, some technological uh, solutions and some other kind of solutions. You need to be creative, uh, and, and you need to use use the whole toolbox which you have uh, as, as your, at your disposal. Uh, would it be okay if I asked some more uh, specific questions about your energy circumstances, and maybe you could describe, I think this is really interesting, a key issue that, you know, cities and countries around the world are, are facing. Um, you know, I mean, you're in a very cold place, not today. Uh, I just was checking, it looks like your temperature is about 27 degrees Celsius today, right now, you know, That's 9, good. 10 in the morning. So um, you're going to be facing heat waves in the summer as you are today. But usually, uh, the way to think about Helsinki is a very cold place in the winter. Um, your, your power generation which has been coal-based, also heats. It's a combined heat and power facility. Uh, maybe you could uh, describe a little bit about the energy architecture that you have. It's quite sophisticated to meet the needs of, of having electricity, but also heat with your combined facility. One of the most sophisticated uh, city systems I've seen in the world. And then if you could just relate that to how you're achieving these efficiencies, was it more on the production of energy side of things in the power plant, reducing the burn, maybe substituting the fuels from coal to uh, biofuel or other things where you're getting efficiency? Or was it also on the other side, the, the demand for energy uh, when as energy flows through the city and you were talking about building codes and maybe you were regulating, you know, how heat is being expended in buildings throughout the city? Just kind of wondering how, you know, for this first phase that you're going through, getting those energy efficiency gains, what was most powerful to get it started and to show those immediate improvements in, in efficiency? Let me start by, by telling that 
and this is not the case in Helsinki, but it's the case in Finland, that uh, Finland, at least some years ago, we used more energy per capita than any other country in the whole world. So, uh, I mean, the starting point is, is maybe not that nice. It's it's not that good. Uh, and, and there are three reasons. The first one is, is cold climates. I mean, we need a lot of energy for, for heating the, the country during the quite long winter. The second reason is a very energy intensive industrial structure, pulp and paper, um, uh, steel, and then so on has always played a big role in the Finnish economy. And the third one is relatively long distances. So uh, a relatively large country with a relatively small population uh, needs a lot of, lot of energy. And that has led, I mean, in Finland already for decades ago to an understanding that it's 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 like it's wise to put emphasis on energy efficiency even if the climate change wouldn't exist so i mean for us the, the starting point was the economic motivation it was not the climate and then i think that is like important to understand that that from the very beginning uh, the 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 way we have tackled emissions and we have tackled the energy issue has actually been an economic uh, issue and then of course when the climate uh, angle uh, became stronger and stronger it has uh, you could say um, increased the the, the 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 pace we are uh, making progress but the starting point was actually economic then uh, as far as the the our energy system here the problem and big challenge is that today uh, i mean today when we have 27 degrees in helsinki we don't need any energy for heating the city i mean not any actually we need some energy for cooling the city but then uh, during the coldest winter time we need a huge amount of energy and then we need a, a capacity uh, during the cold winter days uh, which uh, uh, could be 10 times bigger than the, the normal use during a, a average day during the, the, the yeah. And that has led uh, during the, the uh, history to a system where um, we have a, a combined heat and power production and a district heating system where more than 94% of the, the households and in the city are, are, are linked to do this one. And then this um, uh, creates us a, a possibility to, to really control the system and have a, a comprehensive approach. And then, as you said, uh, we are working on the both sides, both the supply and demand side. Yes, it's a question of both of those uh, uh, in, in a balanced way. Uh, still understanding that the, the supply side and especially what kind of uh, energy sources we use is, is maybe the, the most crucial thing. But I mean, everything, everything matters. Uh, David, I think that we have been discussing using uh, artificial intelligence in, in optimizing uh, the, the, the uh, electricity and, and heat loads during uh, cold uh, winter times and so on. And, and I mean, small um, technological uh, innovations in that field can actually have a quite uh, big uh, uh, impact on, on the whole question. It, it's, I mean, for us, the situation is, is relatively difficult because it, it's, it's much easier in a system where the, the need for energy is, is relatively relatively stable around the world yeah, uh, compared to a city where it's it's totally different. And that's why you, you really need to be creative. And, 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 and what it leads to is that I think that in, in the in the future, we need to have a, a, a more like distributed system uh, uh, and, and, and more sources which we can take into use on those really cold winter years. And then finally, uh, as far as technologies is concerned, I think that the, the big game changer here would be uh, uh, and will be 
all kind of innovations in the field of, of restoring energy. I mean, if you really can do, when we make a, 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 a big development in that field, I mean, it, it changes the game quite a lot. Rick, Sam, so you want to go or, or uh, I, I'd love to continue asking questions, but do you yeah, want to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's okay. You can continue. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is very helpful. I I mean I know uh, I've I visited uh, Helsinki a lot and uh, we, we you know we've had some really nice discussions over the years um, and as we've discussed this challenge and I you know been there uh, with you in Helsinki during the winter and it is you know very cold. I can remember maybe going back to 2018 or so, 2017 when these discussions are kind of getting underway. You've made a lot of progress under your administration. It's kind of fascinating to see how how fast it's been, you know. So that's definitely a line of questioning. How could you transition so quickly? But but you do feel in the winter time that you are dealing with some very serious uh, forces of nature. If you get this wrong, there's going to be people cold. Not not only because it's a combined system. Just so everyone knows, you know, the coal fire plant is generating electricity that's going throughout the city to provide the city with its necessary essential electricity. But, you know, that same process is heating water and that's going around the city, all the buildings, you know, residential, industrial, it's all one very efficient, quite fascinating architecture where you've got hot water flowing through the city and then, you know, reheated as it comes back into the coal fire plant. Maybe you can correct me if I'm getting this a little bit wrong. I've got some very good introductions to it, though, from from um, from the power companies there. You know, how did you really how how are you doing this in a way that keeps people warm and and keeps the electricity flowing um, especially in the winter time because i think when you started doing this it felt a bit more daunting um to pull this off and now you're saying uh, the coal fire plant may actually close two years earlier and so this is this is a very fascinating uh, case study you know people and, and mayors around the world can learn a lot from this because again you're in such a fragile position if you get this wrong um, your your inhabitants are going to feel very cold in that winter time, um, and and so you know how are you actually replacing the heat? This is the question, um, and and able to close that that uh, that other plant so early because it was playing a central role before. What what, what are you discovering that really enables uh, all the needs of the city? To let me start by saying that I'm not an energy engineer. I'm, I'm just a lawyer by training, uh, so I, I do really don't know all the all the details. Uh, but um, then my maybe main point is that the big challenge for us is that it's much easier to replace fossil fuels by renewables in the production of electricity than in the production of heat. And uh, this is maybe our dilemma in today's world, that we actually have had a, a world leading system of combined heat and power production, which has been a really successful way to produce both electricity and, and heat. But in the future, uh, it may be that this is not the right solution because electricity and heat, they take more or less different paths. Uh, and um, uh, even if we do not have that good solar um, circumstances that than some other countries, we have relatively good wind uh, circumstances. And uh, there is, is no one here who do not think that we would be able to replace all uh, fossil fuels by renewables as far as electricity production is concerned. But heat is a, a totally different story. And, and, and there we, to be honest, we do not have the solution yet. We don't know uh, how to replace the, the last uh, coal uh, power plant, which we have decided to, to close by 2029. And that was actually the, the inspiration to a, a global competition, which we started a year ago, the so-called Helsinki Energy Challenge, where we invited the rest of the world to, to help us to solve the problem, which we formulated how to replace 
coal in the heating of Helsinki uh, without using biomass instead. And, and th that was, uh, and I would like to underline uh, the last sentence, uh, we made the challenge for us even more difficult and even more ambitious than, than our Nordic peers. So, I mean, most of the Nordic cities, they have been able to get rid of coal by replacing coal by biomass, by burning biomass. And I do not think it will be a sustainable solution in the long run. It is today, it's maybe in 10 years, but in 20, 30, 50 years, it, it won't be. And uh, I don't want to lock our system to a, a, a way of producing uh, heat, which I don't believe it's sustainable in 20, 30 years. And that's why uh, our challenge is how to replace coal without burning actually anything. And, and, and there, I think, I think this is the big challenge, Dave, for you and your, your company, your, your, your friends around the world, the most brilliant uh, minds in, in the world, how, how to do it. I mean, we had part of the solution. We, we know that by, by using AI and so on, you can, of course, uh, decrease the need for uh, energy and, and heat. And then we need that the more energy efficient buildings we are building so far uh, and, and so on, the less energy we need. Uh, but still, we need a, quite a lot of energy. And uh, today's uh, solutions, which are like technologically mature, like heat pumps uh, and so on, we can solve part of the problem. But, but uh, I mean, I admit that we do not have the, the, the answer to how to do it uh, in, in, in uh, only some years time from, time from now. I don't know whether I answered your question. No, I this, is, no this is perfect. You, Actually, <laughs> no, this is perfect. This is exactly uh, what, what I think is very important to discuss here, if, if I may. So I, I wanted to confirm something for, uh, for the audience. When uh, Mayor Jan refers to biomass, we're referring to uh, uh, things like wood chips or, you know, uh, things that are burned from nature. Um, I, I think it often is a, a fuel that replaces coal, but it's often usually comprised of wood of some kind. Uh, uh, you know, so so you always wonder, um, did trees have to get cut down uh, to, to create the biomass? Of course, uh, you know, in some cases, it's something that falls down in a forest. But if, if, a, if a coal fire plant is being repurposed now to burn wood and the city's dependent on it, then you know at some point you wonder if trees are being you know cut down just to feed the the, the coal fire uh, the plant that's now a biomass plant and then you wonder well are we just kind of creating another kind of problem so i think it's very when marion says that he's not uh, uh you know convinced that this is the right way to go it's because uh you you have to question the source of the biomass right now it's considered to be green fuel and uh, of a different character than than other types of fossil fuels but at the end of the day you're still burning something and you have emissions from it, uh, including trees. Uh, would you agree with that, uh, Marion? What did I just say? I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, um, Finland, Sweden are the um, leading countries within the forest industry in the world. And I mean, we have some side products and side uh, uh, byproducts of the, the uh, um, forest industry which we can use in, in burning, but but it's not enough for the need of bigger cities. It's absolutely what, uh, how you said. Right, okay. Now, I wanna talk about this energy challenge because I think this is so fascinating, um, you know, watching it evolve. And, uh, you know, I can remember when the city was thinking about doing this, which was extremely exciting to me, a, a very bold um, initiative, but I'm, I'm very curious to hear, you know, uh, maybe you could tell the audience a little bit more what this was, how the city embraced innovators for all over around the world to explore this question of, you know, how can you move away from coal fired power, especially for heat? And, and how did the process go, you know, the good and the challenging so other cities around the world can, can learn a little bit more and consider how you ran the program? And then maybe you could just say what, what did you learn uh, that was good and what still remains to be done? You know, what are still the challenging issues that remain after going through that process? Would you be able to talk about it a little bit for us? The starting point was that we had decided to close our last 
coal-driven power plant by 2029. Uh, it's actually a law in Finland that you can't use coal in energy production after the year of 2029. So we didn't have an, an option there. Uh, then the, the question was uh, uh, how to do it. And as I, as I, I, I told you that uh, the, the easy path would be or would have been to replace coal by biomass, and we decided not to take that path. And after that, the question was how to get rid of coal without using biomass. And my people and the, at the energy company said that today's technology can solve part of the problem, but not the whole problem. And that's why decide, we decided to ask the rest of the world to help us. And of course, not only help us, because I believe that uh, all the solutions we got to the competition, um, or I say many of those are, are solutions and technologies which we may not use in Helsinki and which may not be good for us, but could be good for some, some other countries. Of course, uh, the relevant peer group being those cities which have some kind of district heating system. Uh, and then um, we, we started and launched a, a global competition, Helsinki Energy Challenge, uh, with the, the um, first price of 1 million euro. And we drove it uh, for, for a year uh, together with uh, some global institutions. Uh, World Economic Forum was supporting us. Uh, the European Commission was supporting us. Some cities, especially the city of Toronto, were, was a, a close partner for us. And I don't, I think we got something like 250 uh, uh, teams in, in competing. Um, we did not get any, any like uh, Nobel P Prize winning uh, 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 solution, but we got a, a amount of, of interesting ones. But what we learned was that uh, the, there is no single silver bullet, there is no single technology, there is no single solution which we could use, uh, and that's why it needs to be a combination of, of several ones. Then we, what we also learned uh, was that we actually deepened our understanding uh, in the fact that technology is developing all the time, and we should try to avoid locking the, the system in any technology, knowing that there will certainly be a better technology five years later or 10 years later. And you should try to create the system to be as flexible uh, as possible. I mean, it, it, it may be easier said than done, uh, but, but you certainly understand the, 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 the philosophy. I mean, the, the problem is that if you, you make huge investments in an in, in energy system, which cost a huge amount of money today, there is no, not an economic initiative in, in order to replace it in five or 10 years, even if we got a, a much better technology. So you should avoid, avoid you, you uh, ending up into, into a situation like that. And then, I mean, then we also got some uh, interesting technological uh, ideas and solutions, which we are now uh, studying more carefully together with our energy company. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, maybe the most interesting ones are, are somehow linked to heat pumps and especially uh, undersea uh, uh, heat pump systems, which are maybe the, I mean, at least among the most promising technologies uh, just today. That's great. I'd like to uh, Sam, is it okay if I ask a follow up question, but maybe I, I kind of shift a little bit. You want to go in, Sam? Uh... I think you can you can you can continue ask your questions. Uh, sure, I will, okay. I, will, I also have questions for you. So yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, Marianne, I I really uh, what you did uh, to engage the international community uh, and and innovators and technologists and and very knowledgeable people, two hundred and fifty teams, as you said, um, is something that you know I would love to see more cities do. Um, and if I could just change the line of questioning a little bit around that, um, 
I think this is so important, you know, that cities uh, do reach out to the global community, reach out to uh, scientists, technologists, innovators to understand, you know, how you can get the best ideas from in your community and even around the world uh, to address a big challenge, which, uh, you know, you're still working through. Um, and, and, you know, for something that is such a high priority, like in this case, becoming carbon neutral, replacing your fossil fuel sources with other sources for heat. We don't have the answers, but to me, this is so powerful when you reach out to the world to get the best ideas coming in. Um, I find this this process is actually quite difficult for many cities to do. Is one reason why I was so excited to have you, you know, uh, talk to us today because you make it look so easy over there in Helsinki. Uh, and but maybe even since you've become mayor, maybe you've noticed some changes in your own team, your own administration. Um, what do you think cities need to consider to be able to do this better? Um, how can you organize, uh, you know, as as a city administration? To, to actually embrace more innovation, even you know ideas from the global market. Um, what's been challenging about it, but what do you think really makes it work at the end of the day? What has Helsinki done, at least the efforts that you've taken to be able to run programs like this, to be able to open up and, and have the ability to you know, embrace ideas from over the world where, to be honest, I've seen so many cities kind of challenge with that, or just basically you don't really see them doing this at all. And and they're not necessarily expected to do this, but you are able to try these initiatives to reach out. And, and Helsinki, just in closing the question, the long question here, um, really, you know, throughout always has this brand and approach that embraces innovation from innovators around the world. You have a lot of initiatives going, but tell us more how you, you manage your administration, how you manage the city to be more embracing of innovation, because I think this is so essential as we head into new challenges with climate change that cities and regions around the world can do this because there's so many challenges coming their way. They need to be able to work with innovators to, to find the answers to their solutions or work together to figure out what the options are. So can you tell us more, just how do you, how do you manage the city to be able to do this well? I think it's, once again, it's a combination of several things. The first one is the general average mindset within the city hall. I mean, I used to say often that Good is not good enough in today's world. I mean, if you want to be world class, it's something totally different than just being good. And so the level of ambitious, ambition uh, needs to be high enough. And that is some kind of educational process uh, which, which you need to do on an on everyday basis. And I think that is one of the, the most important tasks of a, a mayor is to convince his own people uh, that uh, we are not satisfied with relatively good solutions. We, knew, we want to be better. I mean, that is somehow it's built in in, in the, the dynamic of, of private companies, especially big ones, but it's not in the cities. And that's why you need to have like the mindset of a, a, a private company uh, in the city hall in, in order to, to even think about competitions like this. Then another uh, point is that, especially in Europe, uh, public procurement rules makes it quite challenging. So you, you need to use uh, quite a lot of legal expertise. Uh, I mean, public procurement rules do not make it impossible, but it makes it challenging. So you need to have a, a, a good uh, legal service at your, at your disposal. Then the first, third one is that you need to partner. I mean, uh, we uh, copied the, the uh, idea and concept of a global challenge from the city of New York. And even the city of New York, which has been driving this kind of, as they call the moonshots uh, already several times, even a city of the size of New York, and even the city with the, the reputation of, of New York, partners all the time when they drive competitions with several other stakeholders. So, so in, in order to really get a, 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 I mean, relevant reach globally, you need to have partners like the World Economic Forum, or the city of Toronto, or the European Commission. And, and we spent a lot of time and energy in, in order to convincing, I mean, important, influential uh, 
international partners to 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 support us uh, because i mean you have all kind of competitions uh, going on all the time and then you need to somehow uh, um, make your your voice voice heard and then of course i mean one of the starting points is that you need to be brave enough admitting that we don't have the solution and that's why we are asking uh, uh, all the other people and understanding that that uh, you can never know whether uh, it it leads to to a, a, a breakthrough technology or not and you need to take the risk but then you have to put it into a perspective i mean as i said the the first price for our competition was 1 million euro it may sound like a a big uh, amount of money but actually it's a very small amount of money i mean if someone solves the, the heating problem of the city of helsinki it, it's for the city alone it's not a 1 million it's not 10 million it's not 100 million it's a 700 several hundred million uh, um, innovation and and, and um, i mean, I mean look, as i said a, a combination of of at least those angles this is really helpful but uh you know i'm i'm actually concerned uh that with all the changes happening in the world climate change i, I think about even my my old home area of the bay area where we have climate change we have drought uh, still have some covid but going away now you have big forest fires air pollution you think of cities around the world like a san francisco they may have multiple challenges uh, heading at them simultaneously, like I was just describing. Um, and you see this more and more, you know, power systems going down because of too cold, too hot, floods, et cetera, et cetera. And, and at the same time, many of these uh, mayors and city administrations, they're coping with very fundamental things. It could be crime, could be unemployment, things like this. And yet they have these new challenges. You know, the, the status quo is they, they've been dealing with crime. They've been dealing with homelessness or other things, and now you've got these new challenges uh, related to climate change, like like my my home area, where we used to not have forest fires, we saw power go up, the air pollution, and so I, I'm really concerned that cities need to become very nimble to reach out to the innovation communities. Uh, they're not going to have all the expertise in house. Uh, not every city has an expert in all of these new technologies like AI you mentioned. Uh, so, but how do you think for, for a city or a mayor realizing they got these incoming challenges coming in, in addition to their very busy, perhaps overwhelming plate of things that they're trying to resolve, uh, those, those steady factors, unemployment and so on and so forth. How do you think that even the most challenged city or mayor can find a way to perhaps, you know, either reorganize their administration or make the necessary changes to be able to embrace new ideas so they can start to try to get ahead of these new challenges that may be coming towards them. Any any ideas that you have that you could share on how, you know, how cities and leaders can 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 kind of transition, can set up a team, set up uh, management expertise in their administration to help them cope with these new challenges? That was not an easy, not an easy question. Mm. Um, but I think it's it, it's all about people. It's all about white people. It is about trying to create a atmosphere and the band at the city hall that your city is doing a good job. That is a dynamic workplace uh, that it uh, helps and, and, and makes efforts in, in order for a, 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 I mean in for a better city, a better country, a, a better world, uh, which then helps you to be a, a, a lucrative employer. And then it's about recruiting good people. I mean. Uh, you know, David, at Tencent, and, and you know, with, with all uh, the, the startups you are investing in, I mean, the absolutely most important resource you have is his people. It's talented people, it's brilliant people. And if it's the case 
in big corporations, and if it's the way in small corporations, it's all also the issue in big cities and small cities. But in in order to make them people apply, in in order to make them people um, even think about working for a city, you you need to create a a, a atmosphere, a, a a surrounding where talented, young, modern, uh, ambitious people want to work. And and you you need also to be able to communicate a, a, a strategy, a mission, a vision, uh, which which is 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 um, like um, empowering empowering people. Okay. Yes, thank you, Sam. Yeah. You. Finally, it's my turn. It's yeah. Uh, thank you, though. Very, uh, very very interesting. It's very it's very interesting the in depth uh, discussion. I think you talk about the technology innovations, challenges, even how to the management and the governance, and also in a broad sense, the climate change. So uh, in terms of uh, technology innovation for carbon neutrality, I know that David, you have a lot of new ideas for uh, for this. Uh, you had the AI for Fuel initiative before. Yeah. So I think our audience are also very interested in what are your new ideas about this? Can you share more with us? And I also, sure, sure. I, yeah. I also yeah. like to hear uh, Mayor's feedback on this kind of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, well, it's really great to hear from Mayor Jan because uh, he's, you know, living through this every day, making great progress, setting a great example. But as we're here, you know, it, it always has its challenges. And uh, but when I think of technology, I'm, maybe I could answer your question, uh, Sam, from the perspective of what I'd like to develop with cities like Helsinki, with Mayor yes. Jan right here, and then we can hear from him, you know, how how relevant uh, some of these ideas are. But uh, in particular, maybe we can focus on artificial intelligence. I heard Mayor Jan saying earlier that uh, you know the the city has assets; it has hardware. <laughs> And some of the, you know, these are expensive investments and um, and it's not easy to let them go or not easy just to put them to the side. And I'm I'm very interested in the, the ability for artificial intelligence to to be, you know, inexpensive infrastructure, you know, the cost of software uh, and cloud resources, which is, is is really very little. But with this software, um, you can drive a lot of efficiency. And uh, you know, I'm I'm very intrigued by the ability for artificial intelligence to really urgently accelerate progress um, by by helping us what we do do it in a, a smarter way. So let's just take this challenge of heat in Helsinki, for example. Um, what you're really trying to do as you look at the entire city and the whole ecosystem is that you assume basically that human beings need to be warm at a certain temperature. But actually, for the whole system, um, whether that optimum temperature is, let's say, uh, 21 degrees uh, Celsius or, let's say, 26 degrees Celsius, probably has a, a huge impact on the whole operation of the system because one is you know, trying to guarantee that all the participants in this ecosystem of, of heat are, are either you know, being heated at five degrees higher than the other. So let's say you could actually define um, that, uh, you know, that 21 degrees is the optimum temperature. Um, and then you can analyze the entire system, you know, at all points, how distribution is handled, how, uh, how the, the heating is handled in a building of all kinds, residential, industrial, to ensure that there's the least amount of waste possible. And you can actually do this with your existing uh, coal-fired system because I think you were saying you need to turn it off by 2029. So that means from here until now, you have eight years of progress. And one of your challenges is, is to figure out how are you going to replace it in 2029? And you're, you're working on this. Um, but what I like about software and what I like about AI is to me, this is something that you know a city like Helsinki could implement today um, in this eight year period, because you are running coal and coal is precious uh, in terms, you know, it, it creates emissions, it has a cost, all of these things. So I, I like the ability for software to, to very rapidly 
especially artificial intelligence, working with partners, you know, uh, building models, bring in all the data that you can to make intelligent decisions, uh, understanding how the system works. How do you optimize towards this goal of uh, the human beings in the system keeping that temperature of 21 degrees in spaces where they're needed, by the way? So it may not be all spaces, but you kind of have to analyze where are people most of the time? Where are areas that don't need to be heated? Um, how is, is the water, the heated water flowing through the system? Um, how much, uh, you know, fuel needs to be burned? What's the throughput of the water, the pace of the water coming through? How much volume, you know, all these things. And it's really about optimization. Um, we have found in many AI processes that we've seen in the market, I'm not talking about heat and, and power necessarily, but often when you deploy an AI solution, we, we see these gains of like 20 to 40 percent pretty commonly. I think if a, a startup AI firm that drives efficiency uh, shows you their business pitch, they're usually saying we found we could do 20, 30 percent. It seems like just by the, you know, the first generation of innovation, you can often find that kind of level of efficiency. And to me, that's extremely valuable and powerful, especially for the cost of, you know, intelligent software and, and more maybe, you know, using the data that you already have throughout the city, maybe adding some sensors to give you more fidelity, more data. And sensors are, are usually not that expensive. A thermostat, something that tells you the temperature is an example of a sensor. These are very cheap things. Um, uh, but anyways, to me, that would be really, you know, the... The initiative that, that, that's very exciting to me is that when you think about software innovation to drive efficiency, um, it can move very, very fast. Most of the discussion around carbon neutrality is on the big problem. How do I replace my coal-fired plant? Is it wind? Is it something else that generates heat, nu nuclear fusion or something? These are big CapEx investments <laughs> that require um, a huge amount of planning. Um, financing is complicated. The zoning is complicated. The environmental studies, it goes on and on and on. And these are essential things that are being done. But what I'd love to see happen around the world um, is more discussion about driving fast, meaningful, substantial innovations through software. Um, and I think uh, there's a bit of a chicken or the egg problem around the world right now. Chicken or, or the egg. Right? Where do you start? Is it first the chicken or the egg? Because um, there aren't too many companies building these kinds of solutions right now there's a lot of ai experts out there that could be building these solutions but uh showing the first test cases that work well um getting that first engagement broadly with the city and 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 having the engagement with the city as a partner to build the solutions this is this is kind of challenging around the world um i don't know too many cases for these kinds of innovations actually being done in the market yet um at, at tensa we're very interested to do it um but I think it's just the the early days of being able to engage. But to me, I think you know AI is so powerful. And and let me also add that um, what I was describing is how you could optimize using AI for heat traveling through a city um, and driving as much efficiency as possible by looking at every aspect of that of that process to drive efficiency throughout throughout the system. Right. But you could also look at other systems with AI in a different way for things like power generation, just looking at how the, the power is generated itself, for example, in a, a fossil fuel plant, biomass, coal-fired plant. Again, the focus around the world is to shut down coal-fired plants or, or shift to new forms of energy. However, as we were talking about in the case of Helsinki, there's still eight years to go here, and this plant is running today, and this is the case around the world. Uh, you know, all around the world, Asia, you know, we're all burning fossil fuel plants and there's planning going on where people want to find ways to shift away from it. But that could be, you know, a decade away, sometimes even more. So my view is, OK, while these plants are running tomorrow, you know, for let's implement intelligent systems, you know, building simulators, using all the data we can get, maybe adding some sensors to get even more data or incorporating more data sources to run that process as efficiently as possible. That is, you burn the least amount of coal or fossil fuel, use the least amount of water going into the system. Water is also precious. We talk about food, energy, and water. 
there's this very uh, intricate, you know, deep relationship with thermoelectric power, fossil fuel power, between how much fuel you're burning and how much water you're using, and both are precious. We, of course, want to limit emissions. You optimize everything in that process to maximize your electricity and, and heat coming out, not wasting any of it, um, and uh, all right, and, and limiting the resources needed to maximize the heat. And, and often uh, you can find very substantial uh, gains from doing this just using software alone. So what I'm describing is you have the same building, the same infrastructure. Uh, we're not talking about doing investments in hardware, but with you know uh, deploying software-based intelligent solutions and often using the data that's already in the city, already in the coal fire plant, you can generate you know efficient strategies. Uh, the reason why this is possible is that in in any moment, you know, operating a coal fire plant or any kind of plant, there's so many variables, so many things happening in that process: the, the temperature again, the flow of the water, the temperature of the water outside. Uh, how it's going through the system, the, the, the speed at which it's going through the system, uh, that it's it's just kind of impossible for the human mind to optimize every single one of those variables in real time. Um, for example, it's 27 degrees in Helsinki today. The way the coal fire plant uh, can optimize its running will be very different than if it's zero degrees, because the first of all, we know the temperature of the water is different. It's 27 degrees prior, close to it, or it's going to be much warmer uh, now than during those winter months. So that's going to change the entire behavior of the plant. And, and if your temperature drops in half tomorrow, which is possible, you could have a 14 degree day. Again, we have a shift and it's very difficult for the human mind in real time to be optimizing. You can do a good job. You can have a strategy that works for the human mind, but it can't be second by second, minute by minute, you know, with little optimization tweaks throughout the, the entire system. And then, of course, the generation of the power. So what I'm, what I'm talking about now is really, I think it's more of an agenda or an opportunity for the global technologists to partner with cities to figure out how well does this really work? Um, I think it's conceptual at this stage. I'm not saying we have all the answers. Uh, and and, and Marianne, as much as I'd love to try to sell you something, that's not the approach. We don't have a solution to sell. But I, I you know, I think we we love to participate. But really, for for Helsinki and for other cities, it's really an agenda or an opportunity that I'd love to see happening more often around the world. The innovation around using AI, using software to rapidly. Uh, generate efficiencies. To me, this is the one of the biggest opportunities we have to fight climate change, uh, both in the short term and the long term, is developing more and more of these AI-based solutions to do it. And well, I think, you know, you know, uh, Mary Jan, we're always happy to to work with you and 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 figure out ways to do it, uh, you know, building on our, our good partnership with Helsinki and Finland. Um, but again, what I'm talking about is an overall initiative, I think by the technology industry, to work more closely with cities, to to do to have more of a research mentality, you know, a scientific mentality, to really find things that truly can solve the problem, can make a difference, and being honest about that, you know. So the scientific mindset forces you to acknowledge if something's really working or not, and then when you find something that's working, you keep building on it. You know, software can learn, AI can learn. That's what it does. It will get better and better and better. Um, but I'd love to see more progress being made around the world on this front, because I think it's it's overall just globally been too slow versus the promise of the technology and the challenges that we have ahead. So we need to really try to do more to embrace the software aspect of driving efficiency, moving towards carbon neutrality. That would be like my my high level wish um, globally. I don't know, Mary Jan, how does that sound to you? Um, maybe there's a lot being done already actually that I don't know about. Um, and that would be very exciting, but in general, you know, how do you feel about this opportunity to use software, use AI to drive more efficiency in the system? And do you think there's more work that needs to be done there? Or do you see a lot of things happening already? I think that a lot is going on already, but still we have not seen the real power of AI yet. And I, I do believe that there is a huge potential, unused potential, and, and even there where you have the most advanced solutions today. And I, I mean, you could put it in perspective. Think about the heating system of, of Helsinki. 
as I said, the heating of the city of the Hel of Helsinki is, is standing for more than 50% of all our emissions. If you are able to increase the efficiency of the heating company by, let's say, let me be honest, David, 10%, it would end up in a 5% decrease in the total carbon footprint of the city, which would be a huge impact. There are not many cities in the whole world which are able to make a 5% improvement. And I mean, of course, the, the heating system is, is a, a, a unique uh, issue, but, but uh, and of course you can't gain uh, make as big gains in in all fields but but uh, I, I i strongly believe in, in what you say about the potential of, of ai my second point is that cities are not easy clients uh, uh, we are relatively difficult ones for several reasons public procurement rules risk aversive uh, mindset uh, the, the fact that cities usually move on a systemic level and, and so on and so on. And, and that's why I, I, I strongly sympathize what you said, that actually what we should search for is not that cities are buying something for companies, but, but from companies, but uh, we need a, a like mindset of a co-creation uh, uh, of, of new new things. So the problem often is that cities do not know exactly what they should buy. Uh, they they maybe need a problem, they need a challenge, but they know, don't know the end product what they need. And and in, in order to get to get there, you need some research, you need innovation, and and I think that a modern set the way a modern city should try to handle this is to facilitate as many co-creation uh, possibilities with companies and, and, and cities and research institutes as possible. And I think that is also the only way to really also reach the, the brilliance of, of many uh, startups. Because I mean, a city is a massive organization, and as I said, which moves mostly on a systemic level. It's very difficult for a city. It's difficult for a city to to cooperate with a big company, and it's more or less important, uh, impossible to, to to cooperate with a small startup. And that's why we need to create a new chain, a system where we have at the same time around the same table, in an ideal case, the city, research institutes, big corporations, startups, uh, and then co-create and try to find solutions to a challenge which may be defined by the city. I just love this word. Uh, I think this is your next book, Marianne, a co-creation. <laughs> uh, I've been searching for this word uh, for a long time, thinking about this problem. And I think that you just kind of nailed it for me, co-creation, because I think this is exactly it. Uh, if I could just say, and I know we have some questions from our, our uh, some of our esteemed guests who, who are eager to ask you some questions here, but, um, you know, we we have tools as, as you know the technology industry as as Tencent, for example. We we know artificial intelligence, we know cloud, we know internet technologies, but the kinds of solutions that we need to build now are new. And the only and at the at the same time, we have to make sure that they are fully delivering on the promise that they're really satisfying the needs and challenges of the city. It can't be that you got something that that didn't solve the challenge. It wastes time, and it's actually dangerous, you know, in some cases, lives could be at stake. The only way to really get there is, as you say, co-creation, uh, to, to honestly and with open minds partnering together to build solutions that truly make a difference in that city. And I think this is this should be a, an initiative, you know, around the world uh, where, you know, cities and technologists with scientists involved and other experts are really working together to solve these challenges in, a, in an intellectually honest way scientifically relevant way, but using the technology to really ensure that problems are being solved, uh, that things are changing in the right direction, and that you're iterating. You have a dialogue going because you can continuously improve. You solve the first challenges and then you, you solve more from there. So I, I absolutely love this word, uh, co-creation. Uh, I really maybe appreciate it. Maybe, 
David, maybe we should co-write this this book. Finished the uh, the second the, the first book, which was a huge amount of effort. You know, working with our ten cent research team, they 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 worked so hard on that with me as well. But uh, well, now now you're talking. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk <laughs> after the uh, the event today. This is okay. a great idea. Okay, great. It's it's great to hear those new innovation ideas from David. I also hear the feedback from uh, Mayor Yan. I think we are we are running out of time. So I think. Uh, and we, are, we still have a, a list of experts. They are eager to discuss with you. But but I have my final final question. I think it's to uh, both of you. Uh, so uh, uh, finally, in terms of like carbon neutrality and sustainable development, what's what's your suggestions to those Chinese mayors? If if you if you you you, want, you have some suggestions, yeah, I can go first. I think. I think you should go back to the basics where I started. The first one is you need to think what you really want. Are you really committed or not? Uh, because you can't achieve anything which you do not want to achieve. So you, you need to have the will. If you have the will, then you certainly find the way. The second point is that you need to have a comprehensive approach. And, uh, and it starts from, I mean, from the facts. You, you, the starting point should be that you measure as uh, well as possible where your emissions actually come from. In order to, to, you, in order to solve something, you need to deep dive, dive deep in, in, into your problem. You need to understand your problem uh, uh, and the size of part of the problem. And then the third uh, suggestion is that don't try to solve any big issues alone. No one does in today's world. There is no city, there is no corporation, there is no one who uh, is able, or even if one could be able, who should try to do it alone. Partner, partner with other cities, partner with your business society, partner with research institutes, partner with international peers. Uh, I mean, best solutions and uh, brightest innovations have always in the history being born where where people from different backgrounds and different cultures meet. Okay, thank you, Mayor Yin. Uh, partner, co-creation. It's great. Okay, David? Yeah, I'd like to continue on that thread. I think I think if I could say anything to the, the, the Chinese mayors, um, co-creation is so important because technology companies, we have our tools, we have ideas, we have technological capabilities, uh, but to build the kind of solutions that can truly meet the needs of cities, we can only do that by partnering, uh, whatever the challenge may be with industry, uh, with local utilities and so on and so forth. We won't be able to build solutions in a vacuum. We have to test them in the real world with local partners and 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 confirm that they're doing the job, brainstorming together what could be done better, what can drive more efficiencies, only by, by having that dialogue and working together and, and finding more sources of data, more sources of insight, can we truly build the kinds of solutions that need to be built going forward in a complex world? So I think you know the, the idea is very much, how can we find more ways for cities to work with innovators, technologists, scientists, to, to have this this co-creation uh, model of, of partnership to uh, to meet our needs. Can't do it alone. None of us can. Okay, great. Thank you, David. I think uh, we still have a lot to discuss, but uh, uh, we, we have a list of experts that are eager to join you. So maybe let's t uh, turn to our Q&A uh, session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Yan He from Hong Kong University of Science and uh, Technology. Yeah, Professor Yan, the floor is open. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's good to hear the discussion. Uh, here I can give one example uh, of uh, where we need uh, co-creation, for example. Um, uh, I work on solar cells, and we know that uh, uh, the conventional solar cells are based on silicon, and uh, people want to integrate more solar cell in the city, but uh, silicon solar cell is not the best type. So scientists, we are developing a new type of solar cell called organic solar cell, which is uh, good looking. 
And uh, also flexible, semi-transparent, you can possibly uh, integrate into more different places in the city, you know, in buildings, you know, uh, along walkways. Um, but there's one problem. It's a business problem. For any type of new technology, at the starting point, the, the cost is higher than silicon solar cell. So, so silicon solar cell, the cost is low because the scale is big. For new technologies, the scale is small. So at this point, their cost is high. So uh, we're thinking of uh, maybe governments and then you know building owners and technology companies can work together and co-create a uh, a dynamic situation, a mechanism where we can utilize new technology to to reduce the carbon footprint in the city. And for example, so if uh, if a government or cities we uh, we decide that, okay, if uh, you install more solar cell on your buildings, and then you, we, can, we can let you put a couple more floors because your, your building is more green, right? And then the, the, uh, the uh, builders, the real estate developers, they have more motivations to adopt the new technology, even if it's more expensive, right? So this could help uh, the new technology to, to scale up to develop and reduce cost, and also demonstrate to people that, oh, there are things like this. The solar cells can be uh, attractive. And they're, they're, they do not just produce electricity. They're good looking too, right? Mm -hmm. And once more and more people know this, and more and more people accept this, this new te technology can, can uh, move on to the fast track of development. So what, what do you think of this idea? Do you think this is the one uh, potential Passive co-creation. I have some ideas for this, Mary. You want to go first? No, no, please, David. Okay. Well, I think what's really important, Professor, is uh, that, you know, for this kind of new technology, what we need to be able to do in the world, let's just say, um, and I wasn't sure where this is being developed, but maybe I'll just assume Hong Kong for now, because you're calling in from Hong Kong, if I understood. So, uh, okay, <laughs> I think we missed that, but let me try to just do a shorter answer then. What's so important is that we can pilot technologies like this more rapidly. My assumption is that cities don't necessarily have large budgets. Uh, some may have more than others, but uh, in the case that they don't have budgets to experiment, to pilot and demonstrate these technologies more rapidly, they can do other things like provide a good venue uh, for this uh, government owned or managed buildings, for example, uh, the necessary permitting or uh, participating to support the introduction of these kinds of technologies around the city uh, in finding areas where it's, it's relevant to trial such technologies. And then of course, reaching out to the business community, investor community, other communities to work together to, to quickly trial and pilot uh, technologies that are meeting a serious need. And so I think this is overall a capability that cities will do very well to develop it. And for the kind of technology you, you mentioned, I, I think, this is what we really need to quickly evaluate the technologies in the real world, see how they're doing, provide feedback to the entrepreneurs, what's good, what needs to be improved, and, and get a more rapid uh, iteration loop where the, the innovators and entrepreneurs, they're getting feedback, and the city is also seeing, is this something that could meet our needs? But you do it on a pilot basis, on a small scale basis, but we need more rapid piloting and rapid iteration. So iteration. So we're looking at more things faster, identifying what moves the needle, what maybe still needs more work. That that would be my my view on this overall question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Yanhe and David. Uh, Mayor Yan, yeah, what's, your, what's your feedback? I could maybe elaborate a little on what, what David say. I, I strongly believe that uh, that it is, as, as he said, uh, I mean, I, I'm the first person uh, on earth who had received a lunch delivered by a drone in a, a urban environment. And, and, and the reason why uh, so is that the, the, the company who is developing that kind of, of service uh, decided that the city of Helsinki is a optimal test bed of that kind of pilot and demonstration. So, so, I mean, it is true that you need to have a lucrative, well-functioning uh, environments, cities, circumstances where you can test and, and pilot uh, things uh, 
on a systemic level. Cities which are like big enough uh, to, to create uh, a, a urban environment, which is uh, lucrative enough, but at the same time, small enough and, 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 and um, functional enough to, to make it feasible. So that's uh, one part. The other one is when your professor asked whether this could be a, a idea for co-creation, you could say that in theory, yes, uh, it, it could be. Uh, of course, the, the challenge for the, the city is uh, that uh, there is easily uh, not tens, but hundreds or thousands of companies who have some ideas which they want to co-create with, with the city. And uh, I mean, that's why, it, it, I mean, the, the optimal case starts from a realization of the city of a challenge they have. And then like, like asking the business society to join them in, in order to try to find a, a, a solution to that. Uh, so, so, but yes, I mean, in fear, it, it, it could be. Uh, thank you very much. It sounds like uh, uh, it's possible and the cities uh, are willing to consider these different new technologies and ideas. Uh, just that uh, uh, we have to build a strong case, uh, you know, make a good pitch so that uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the overall benefits, overall costs, it, it's uh, efficient, it's more, you know, uh, it's reasonable, right? Otherwise, you cannot take the pitch from every company and the cities cannot be the child okay. place for all these new things, right? So we have to, uh, like like David said, we have to make sure we have a fast track in the piloting and uh, demonstrate the good benefits and hopefully make a good pitch and convincing story to let more cities to, to adopt these new technologies. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Yan. I think we, we have to move to the next question. I think, uh, uh, let's invite uh, expert Ma Jian from the Paradise Foundation. He's an environment expert. Ma Jian, please raise your question. Oh, thank you, Sam. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my name is Ma Jian from uh, the Paradise Foundation. We are a China-based uh, conservation organization. First, uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction and uh, which give us an uh, overview of how our city cope with climate change, climate challenges. I, uh, you just mentioned the biomass energy. I think that's a very sustainable way on uh, combating climate change. I have actually two questions for you. The first one is, uh, how do you evaluate nat uh, natural systems? Because, you know, in my field, uh, the nature-based uh, uh, solutions are very hot topic right now and uh, how do you evaluate that and uh, uh, the second question is can you introduce the way your city in uh, natural resource management or nature protection uh, in the context of climate change thank you once again it was not an easy question uh, i think that it's um of course, those issues are linked to each other, but at the same time, they are different issues. I mean, the, the case of um, um, securing biodiversity uh, in the world is, is one of the big hot topics of our time. It may, may become even a, a, a bigger issue than, than the climate crisis is, is, is one day, but somehow it is a, a different topic. Uh, uh, but I think what, what your, your question does is that it underlines the importance really to have a, a comprehensive approach and, uh, and have a, a holistic view. To understand that everything affects everything and there are no easy answers to any any questions you need to take into account all kinds of angles there are what we have not discussed yet is is uh, the social questions uh, which is uh, maybe a, already a mainstream uh, topic uh, in several countries that when tackling climate crisis you should do it in a also in a socially sustainable way um, and, and as you mentioned then there are 
several other environmental angles uh, also uh, which you take uh, need to take into account. I, to be honest, I don't know exactly how the city of Helsinki evaluate this. Uh, I know that we take it into account that we try to to always when we do anything in order to cut emissions, study it carefully. What kind of economic, social, environmental, cultural effects it, it effects it has, and if the side effects, uh, negative side effects, are are too big then we try to, to, to choose, an, choose another path. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question directly. I don't know the exact answer, how we do it. But my, my point is that uh, you can't isolate even the biggest question of our time, which is the, the climate crisis, from all other societal issues which we have on the table at the same time. And you always need to study carefully what kind of implication different kind of solutions have on the society as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think your uh, answer is a uh, very good. Come back to the your the word you 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 just said co-creation. I think we this is a holistic uh, uh, challenge. So we need uh, joint efforts on that so it's not a sole uh, uh angle to solve the climate changes and uh, yeah i totally agree with you thank you okay thank you uh, Ma Jian, uh for your question uh, next i'd like to move to uh professor uh Hua Ying, uh director of Konai china center center he's also the associate professor of design and the environment Analysis, Cornell University. Professor Hua Ying, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Um, this is a really intriguing um, dialogue, and thank you for the opportunity. At Cornell, uh, we also have uh, many professors working on different aspects to um, reduce the, the carbon footprint um, and also um, including um, sort of a larger scale um, solution. So my question actually, uh, when David was commenting on Mayor Yang made it sound really easy. So I was thinking about uh, the barriers um, to the large scale um, changes. So Mayor Yang, at the very beginning of your uh, remarks, uh, you mentioned the importance of the willingness to think long term and the sort of necessity of um, thinking long term and the opportunities that creates for uh, business and individuals. So uh, my question is, um, if we look at China, uh, we can see most business decisions are still uh, pretty much first cost driven. And um, so based on your um, experience um, and also your observations of the, the partners, what's going on in the, in the world, um, could you comment on um, how to um, sort of create the policy environments at the micro, at like the city level and create um, incentives to encourage, motivate, push, or I mean, demand uh, businesses to, to think uh, long-term. So this is the um, I mean, first part of my question. And very quickly, the second part, um, you talked about the importance of having a comprehensive set of solutions to make, um, I mean, to push um, the, 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 for a transformative um, change. But uh, we do know that um, Finland and other Nordic countries are known for uh, your sustainable uh, lifestyle. I think um, it's just so encouraging to see um, you guys are decoupling the, the quality of life from the consumption of energy. And then people are able to sort of focus on the, the core aspects of what make people happy, uh, what uh, they found the value in this and then enjoying this. Um, so are there any secrets or any suggestions you can share with us? Um, so that we don't all just focus on ownership, I mean, having more things, carrying on the big burden, consuming energy to, to achieve the quality of life. So just these two aspects, uh, long-term thinking and the, the quality of life. Thank you. I think that we end up with more and more difficult questions all the time and more and more challenging questions. But, but anyhow, thank you. Thank you so much. I think the question of short term versus long term is really a, a global issue. If you say that most decisions are cost driven in China, I can guarantee you that they are more cost driven uh, in most of the other parts of the, of the world. 
and it it really is a a, a big challenge. I I have uh, some in some cases I have tried to to encourage the financial sector to to create new products in in order to solve this issue, but I have not managed to do this. And I, let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, if you have a, a a house, you are building a new house, and you uh, wonder whether you should make it uh, still twenty percent more energy efficient or not. And um, your construction company tells you that it will cost you five percent more. Uh, what are you doing? Mm. You, if you have a short-term view, you think that five percent more, I don't pay it for the uh, more energy-efficient and more climate-friendly uh, uh, house. But if the and, and I mean, if you go to the bank and, and ask for a loan in in order to to to, to build that that house, but if the product would not be the house itself, but it would be the house and the energy bill for the next 20 years, and you would go to the bank and ask for a loan for the house and the energy bill for the next 20 years, then, I mean, you would have the motivation to, to, to build it, to make it more energy efficient. And in most cases, it's not about 20 years. I mean, even in Finland, we end up in in, in situation where you talk about five to 10 years. So the payback time for a more uh, energy efficient building in circumstances, and I mean, we are a leading country in energy efficiency, it can be as short as five and 10 years. And still, it's really difficult to convince people to make the extra effort in, in order to, 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 uh, to, 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 to go for the more energy efficient building. And here is where uh, regulation also comes in. And uh, uh, in, in several European countries, also including Finland, uh, we have, uh, in those cases, in some cases, used binding building codes in, in, in order to force uh, like people to build more energy efficient. Of course, that is not the optimal case. It's always a better case if, if people do it uh, uh, of the, from their own will and not, not forced. But uh, I think it's also an educational issue. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any, any answer to, to your question, only telling that uh, there is maybe where the, the society and the government comes in, into the picture and, and tries uh, with uh, and uses different other kind of methods like regulation. And then uh, the quality of life is, I do think that, to be honest, it is a luxury of societies which have already reached a relatively high level of uh, well-being. Um, that a, a relatively big part of the society is going to prefer other things than new things <laughs> uh, and, and, and bigger houses and, and better cars. Uh, so uh, I think that you have seen it uh, in, in several countries that when they reach a, 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 a specific level of development and where the, the middle class is going to be already relatively big and they have got uh, more or less what they had dreamed about when they were kids and they have a, 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 a significantly better quality of life than their, their old parents had, they maybe start to value other things. Uh, and I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not a, a non-problematic issue. I mean, at the same time, we can say that it, it's it's uh, happy and it, it, it creates happiness that, that uh, people uh, value things like uh, um, nature and uh, and uh, spare time and uh, time with their, their kids and 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 
uh, holidays and things like that, it at the same time, it is also a challenge for your economy when people want to work less and less. So, uh, I mean, you need to find a balance where, where at the same time, you understand that, that people value other things and what makes them happy is not maybe just working hard and, 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 and earning more money, but at the same time, you need to have mm, motivations for people to work hard. <laughs> Let me put it in, in this way. So uh, at, at the time being, I'm glad when we are ranked as the happiest nation in the world, but I'm actually worried that we aren't in five or 10 or 20 years uh, if people, uh, I mean, do not understand it uh, correctly. What it actually that actually the the situation where we are now has been based on hard work, and you can't stop working hard. Or if you do, then you won't have it anymore in in the future. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Huai, and. Uh, uh, your question and, uh, and answers. I think uh, I know that our audience still have a uh, lot of questions to ask, but we are actually running out of time. Uh, mayor Yuan is the active mayor of Helsinki, so I think uh, his time is very <laughs> precious. We have hijacked him for almost uh, two hours. And a huge thank you to uh, Mayor Yuan and, and to David and also to our audience here. Uh, just as we discussed, the road to carbon neutrality and uh, sustainable development, there are a lot of opportunities and uh, challenges. It requires uh, the cooperation of various parties, including the government, enterprises, civil society, and even you and me. So it seems the key word today is co-creation, the partnership. I think uh, uh, this kind of dialogue is great for us to learn uh, from each other, and we, we, we can also uh, share the best practice uh, of the world. Uh, this is Tencent Dialogue with uh, Mayor Yen Vapavohi, uh, Mayor of Helsinki, and Mr. David Wallenstein, Chief Exploration Office of Tencent. This is Sam Tsai from Tencent Research Institute. That's all for today. See you next time in Tencent Dialogue. Bye-bye. <laughs>